Good morning, church family, and welcome back to another one of our online Sundays. Two weeks ago, we started a new preaching series called Come Dine With Me, and I'll be carrying on with that a little bit later in this video. Rodney picked up the theme last week, and we had communion together. And today we'll be looking at a text that's found in Luke chapter 7, just in case you wanted to get your Bibles and be ready uh, in a few minutes' time. Coming up in a few weeks' time, in the next school holidays, will of course be church camp, and you are invited. In fact, not only are you invited, and I don't say this to everybody, church camp is better when you are there. So the information, by the time this video comes out, the information should already be out, and registrations will be opening next week. And then it will be an opportunity for you to get your name down, and then to come up to church camp and spend some time together with your church family. We eat together, we play together, we pray together, we worship together, and we just have a general all-round good together time. And now we're going to be able to do something which is one of the things that we can do communally, and that is to sing. So if you want, if you're in the privacy of your own home, have a look around. Probably no one can hear you. Here's a song which will be coming up, and why don't you add your voice to theirs as we sing together.
Have you ever done that thought exercise where people say, if you could invite anybody for dinner across the ages, alive or dead, who would you invite? Very often, there are some common names which come up, and one of the names which is common for Christians and non-Christians alike is the name of Jesus. People are sometimes, even if they aren't followers of Jesus, are curious about him and would love to sit around a dinner table having a conversation with him. The thing about Jesus as a dinner guest, though, as we'll discover in our text today and in some of the texts that are coming up, is that it didn't always go quite so smoothly. In fact, sometimes he would say things or point things out or do things which were quite out of the ordinary and might make people feel a little bit uncomfortable. And as I say, our text today is no different. A few lines before we get to today's text is this accusation which has been leveled against Jesus. Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, you would imagine that if Luke was going to counter such a claim, he might make his very next story, the very just lines later, something maybe about fasting. And if he is going to go to a meal, at least let it be to a a house of some respectability. And then let him follow all the social norms and customs, not eat too much or drink too much, no drama, eat your food, let those who want to see you see you and then move on. No harm done. Well, instead of that, Luke does something quite different. He delves straight back in and drama ensues and what happens will only confirm the um, people's suspicions about Jesus one way or the other. And for that, we turn to our text. It's found in Luke chapter 7, and we shall read from verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he should know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Oh, tense. So this is Simon the Pharisee. Not to be confused with Simon Peter or Simon the Zealot or Simon the father of Judas Iscariot, nor Simon of Cyrene, nor even Simon the Tanner. This is Simon the Pharisee. It seems an invitation had been extended to Jesus by Simon, and Jesus had accepted. He dines with whoever invites him. He did, after all, come eating and drinking, which we looked at in the first, um, the first sermon in the series. He ate with tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees too. It seems that the, the layout of some homes would mean that there was a courtyard area where others, not the invited guests, might linger. And it could be to get scraps of food, but it could also be for something what has been described in the account by Luke here. 
that a person of interest was around, in this case Jesus, and you wanted to observe, hear, and maybe even participate in the conversation, and that could be done. So this wasn't like looking at someone through uh, the window of a restaurant while they ate and you were somehow removed from them and not being able to communicate or engage with them at all. This was something where you could participate in what was going on. So Jesus arrives at the house of Simon the Pharisee. So far, so good. And in the very next sentence, we are introduced to a person that brings tension to the scene. You know there's going to be a clash of some sort. We have entering the scene a woman who has lived a sinful life. Now, before we get on a little bit further, the NIV has the way they've translated the, has translated this has actually removed some of the drama of what is taking place. The King James and others have the word behold. Behold this woman or look or see and when I went back to have a look, the King James is more accurate in this sense because it's actually there in the Greek. You see, we, the word behold, it, it, makes, it draws our eyes, it brings our attention even more so to this woman who was sinful. The other night we were playing netball, it was a few weeks ago we were playing netball, and the calls weren't going our way and it was a little bit frustrating. And at one point, the goalkeeper of the opposing team wandered quite significantly out of the area that she was allowed to be in. So I shouted, and the ball had already gone down the other end of the court, but I shouted to the ref. I said, ref, and then I had raised eyebrows and big eyes, and with my hands, I pointed to what was taking place. I was saying, behold, look, see what is taking place. And to my chagrin, the ref waved play on, ignored my pleas for justice, and then they went and scored, and it has become our habit, we went on to lose the game. But behold, and this is something far more important, behold this woman, a woman from the city who had lived a sinful life. Just two sentences into the story, we know something's about to happen. We are not told what the sinful life was, but it hasn't stopped commentators having a red-hot guess. At, uh, um, at guessing at, at what sort of sin this woman had in her life. The most pervasive of the guesses seems to be that this woman was a woman of ill repute, sinful, because she was a prostitute. And then you wonder, is there anything to support this assertion? Well, not really. It does seem to be conjecture. And even those who seem to suggest this, from what I've read, don't have a whole lot of evidence to back it up. They seem to make the statement, but no evidence to build up in order to make that statement. What we have told is that she has lived a sinful life and we're not told what that is. So whatever it was, it seems to have been a long-term thing. It was um, a, a sinful life, and but we don't know what it is other than it was known by people. So we have this woman who for a period of time has lived what has been described as a sinful life and something about it seems to have been obvious because people knew that. This woman would not have been invited. We all know the Pharisees were quite particular who, with whom they ate. They did not want to be defiled. You see, their land had already been defiled by these Gentile Roman soldiers who marched all over it. But they had no control over that. They had control over their own bodies and their own homes. So they were very careful about who they ate with and who was invited into their homes. And they would keep control unless there is a woman who is described as sinful who wants to be near one of their guests. Then it becomes a little more problematic, as we have in our text. Back in the day, the way they would eat wouldn't be seated, seated at a table like we might be today, but rather they would recline at a table. And I don't know, it seems like a terribly uncomfortable way to eat, but that's the way it was. They would lean on their left arm and they would use their right hand for eating. And you see, being on the floor when you eat, that's what makes picnics so bad. When people give an invitation to have a picnic, all I hear is an invitation to eat food uncomfortably. But anyway, that's the way they did it, and that's likely how it was happening here. 
their main part of their body would be at their table, their feet would extend back, no one wants smelly feet near their face at a dinner table. Behind Jesus, we have this woman, this sinful woman, and she is crying. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to eat a meal where someone who is real close to you, uh, proximate uh, proximate to you, is crying quietly. I mean, it's really, really hard. Now, you may wonder how I know whether she was, uh, how it was that she was crying. And the truth is that there's a Greek word that means to cry quietly. And that's not the word that is used here. The word that is used here is another Greek word that means to wail, to sob, to weep. This is a, the word for ugly crying. This is that word. So now imagine trying to eat when someone is ugly crying near you, weeping, wailing, sobbing. Don't, not not in the sense of I've stubbed my toe and the, the tears subside as the pain subsides. Think more a deep sadness or a heartache or, or an ache that, that is, can't be located easily enough. That, that there's something that hurts and you think, well, mum can kiss this and make it better. It wasn't that. Think of a a sobbing or a a tears that might come because you know how much you have been forgiven or the fact that you have been loved and maybe for the very first time and you sob and you wail and you access an ocean of tears. You didn't think it was possible for one body to contain. This was that crying. So try to think of the noise and the tears and all the other things that happens when you cry. This was all happening at the dinner table. Then comes an act of hospitality by this woman who was sinful. I say hospitality, it was much more than that. It was an act of devotion. She has so many tears, it wets the feet of Jesus. Another sign of the extent of her crying. I don't know if you've ever been out in a car and there's a little bit of rain or maybe there has been rain and the, the cars in front of you are picking up the water off the road and you try and set your, your windscreen wipers, but there's not quite enough rain really to warrant the windscreen wipers, but then it gets too much and there's no setting which seems to be just perfect for it. And it's, it's kind of that, that frustrating, yeah, just a little bit, not enough sort of sense of, of rain which was there. This wasn't that what was happening to the feet of Jesus by the tears of this woman. Think rather torrential rain. This would have been enough to set your your windscreen wipers on fast mode. This is how, this is what she did. Then to dry these tear-stained feet, she uses her hair, she kisses them, and she pours on perfume. Now this was a scandalous moment. When a Jewish woman got married, her hair was put up and it was never seen down again, except by her husband. That was it. No one else would get to see it. So this was an act that would have never have seen the light of day reserved for a husband and a wife. This is the scandal, the likes of which tabloids could dine on for weeks. In letting her hair down, she does the unthinkable. The Pharisee, Simon, who was present, said to himself. Now that is to say, he didn't say it out loud. He thought to himself. It was an internal question, an internal conversation. I don't know if you've ever had an internal conversation. This was that. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what sort of woman she is. Jesus then responds in an amazingly prophetic way, answering an internal question with an out loud answer. And he gives a parable about forgiveness and who would love more. Simon can see the way that this is heading. And then when Jesus asks him which one loved more, Simon seems to be almost begrudgingly saying, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Then, and then this is where things get properly tense. Jesus says, do you see this woman? Now, obviously, Simon could see this woman. She was right there. He had been offended by this woman. It was a rhetorical question. Jesus doesn't pause. He just keeps going. He points out all the things that Simon should have done as a host. This wasn't a a host doing the most. This was was just a, a normal cultural expectation of what would happen under a normal hospitable environment. 
This was living the social protocols of the day, especially when someone was invited. Their rules of hospitality had significant meaning in them. Now, we've lost some of that meaning, I guess, in our hospitality, but there are still some rules that we have. When keep people come around, maybe we have tidied up. Maybe we have made enough food for everyone. Maybe we have ensured there's enough seats for people to sit around and talk together and eat together. Maybe we stop what we're doing and give them, give them our attention. But for them, in this particular day, their, their social norms, their hospitable norms, carried a greater weight than ours do. And yet, Simon the Pharisee had not done any of them, but this woman who was sinful had. She washed feet. She greeted with a kiss. She poured perfume. Her response to Jesus wasn't a response of curiosity, but a response, a response of love. She didn't offer the least of what could be done. She offered the most of what she was able to do. She didn't offer a kiss on the cheek as an equal, but a kiss on the feet with, as, as, a, as a sign of devotion. Not water but, uh, for the feet, but tears. Not a drop of perfume on the head, but a jar of perfume for his feet. She was lavish in showing her love for Jesus. This was in the same moment humble and extravagant. She was willing to risk being publicly berated. She was willing to risk being throw out, thrown out. She must have hoped Jesus would respond in a certain way, but she wouldn't have known how he was going to respond. She must have wondered what Simon and the family, or Simon the Pharisee and the family may have responded to her. If we took a quiet moment to compare Simon the Pharisee and this woman who was sinful and how they responded to Jesus, and let's put it on a spectrum. Let's say on a scale of, of 0 to 10, 10 being the way this woman responded. Actually, let's take it minus 10. Simon the Pharisee and plus 10 this woman, 0 would be neutral. Wherever it is, or whatever, when you look at this particular spectrum, where would you place yourself on that spectrum with regards to devotion to Jesus? Would you be closer to Simon the Pharisee? Would you be closer to this woman who was sinful? And the truth is just wherever you are, and this is your own assessment, is there anything you could do to nudge it up a little bit, to move it just a little bit further along, nearer to where this woman would be, um, where we would judge this woman to be? Now, I'm not suggesting everyone needs to get a loud hailer and a soapbox and you know, talk to everyone about this bus that might knock them over and they could appear at the pearly gates speaking to St. Peter. Just really, what are some ways that your faith and my faith could be a little bit more like the sinful woman and what she offered to Jesus? She's been introduced into the scene in the first instance with the words, Behold! And since then, we still have our eyes on her. And Jesus seems to be deliberately drawing our eyes to her. His actions and his words cry out, Behold this woman! There's a switch in the story, which I'm going to mimic in my sermon. Up to this point, uh, titles or descriptors have been offered. It was Simon the Pharisee or this woman who was sinful or this sinner who was a woman. The, re the reality is our, our titles are not really of any help, ultimately. In our text, we repeatedly read of these two, Pharisee and sinner or sinful. And I have done that up until now. But then Jesus changes things. He turns to the woman and he says to Simon, the descriptors are dropped. When we stand before Jesus one day, only one descriptor is going to matter, which I'll talk about in just a moment. You see, it doesn't matter what you earn or your title or the good things that you have done or the bad things that you have done. You simply stand. Not in the power of a testimony of another, nor in a relationship that you have with anybody else. You simply stand stand. You see, the way this story ends, we need to change the way we would describe this woman. In, in encountering Jesus, her story changes and our story changes. When Jesus speaks to her, he tells her her sins are forgiven. And when we, our sins are forgiven, we don't need to carry that moniker for life and be described in that particular way. 
Rather, we could call her a woman who was forgiven, a woman who is a child of the God Most High, a woman who is a follower of Jesus or something else. You see, but Jesus tells her her faith has saved her and to go in peace. Her faith saved her, her faith in Jesus. Faith provided by the Spirit of the living God, no doubt, but faith nonetheless. And we all have that sort of faith. You see, we all have faith and we all place it somewhere. We might have faith in our finances. Hopefully that will be enough. Or faith that says that everything happens has happened by accident and this is as good as it gets. Or faith that says that life is all there is and there is nothing beyond. These are all faith positions. Or this faith position. The invitation to place our faith in Jesus. So where are you today in your faith walk? Are you walking towards him? Is it with Jesus? If not, then why not make it different from this day? Then what is said to this woman can be said to each one of us. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Before we jump on Simon, just know he did invite Jesus. He did think he might be a prophet. He did call him rabbi. He had all the same information. And like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, we don't know what Simon does at the end. We're kind of left hanging with the response of Simon. Yet we can all know what this woman knew, that the only thing that matters is our relationship with Jesus. So today, can I encourage you to take your next steps both towards and with Jesus? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he came he lived, he died, he was resurrected, and he is seated at your right hand, interceding on our behalf, even in this moment. Help our lives to be lived an expression, uh, as an expression of our love and devotion towards him. Allow our hearts to be soft in the hands of your Holy Spirit, who continually calls us to yourself, who continually hones us and, and draws us into being better versions of who we are, that can only come about by relationship with Jesus. Allow us to live our lives for the glory and the honor of the one that we follow. His name is Jesus. Amen.